What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here at GSD Studios. First off, thank you so much for checking out today's content. I'll make this extremely fast, but I need to plug our sponsors that make this show possible. Our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com, by far the most effective and affordable real estate agent website and database platform in the industry. It is the system I use to sell 50 plus homes every single month. Check it out at www.perfectstormnow.com. Our second sponsor is my personal 90 day mastery bootcamp, which is again, my personal real estate agent mentorship program, where we spend 90 days together, 12 live sessions. You get daily access to me inside the program. You guys, we go so extremely in depth. There's nothing that's incomplete about this program. You're going to get all the tools that you need to go out there and crush it inside your real estate business. Make sure to go check us out. www.90daymastery.com. You can watch in depth videos videos of exactly what's covered to see if the program is for you, um, see all the raving testimonials we have from all of the amazing agents and clients that went through the program. So make sure to check us out, www.90daymastery.com. All right, you guys, let's jump on in to today's content. Right. What is up, everybody? Joshua Smith here at GSD Studios, and uh, today I'm joined here at GSD Studios with my good friend, Ben Barber, and we're here to drop some massive, massive knowledge on you guys today. So today we're going to talk about something that's really important um, uh, for a real estate agent to know. Um, you got to know how to move, shift, and adapt with the marketplaces. It's absolutely critical. One of the reasons that my business has been able to grow 12 years straight with never having a year that wasn't better than the previous year, regardless of the marketplaces, I've learned how to shift with the marketplaces. You know, one thing Ben and I always talk about is it's never if a market's going to crash, it's always when. Markets have corrections. There's ups, there's downs. There's no such thing as a bad market. It's always whom is the market good for, but you need to know how to adapt um, as Ben says, um, you got to make sure to know how to, uh, how to create a recession proof business and knowing how to get into REO is a huge component of that. So Ben, welcome into the studio, awesome. my man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I love it. Yeah, this is badass, dude. So, um, first man, before we get into, you know, uh, um, a lot of things we're going to talk about with REO and the importance and, you know, how to get in all that fun stuff, man, give, uh, give, uh, everybody a background, or, or um, let's just go into your background, man. Like, how, okay. how did you get started in REO and what, what's your experience been? You got it. Okay, so uh, for me, you know, it's, it's funny because I was kind of part of the problem and then part of the solution. So my background was always mortgage lending, uh, representing like Wells Fargo, some of the, the bigger Aegis, Mila, out as an account executive with these programs. And, you know, 2006, 2007, everybody's getting com incredibly competitive. And it's like the lending guidelines start getting incredibly lax. 2008, you know, the, the crisis hits and everybody who was in the financial business who was on the lending and the operations side, you know, you're kind of out of luck. So I fell into it backwards, really just looking for a job. After that, you know, there were so many people that like mortgage lenders weren't lending. A lot of places were closing up shop. And some people I had worked with went over to a company, Green River Capital, that was in the REO space. Uh, but was really just getting started, just a handful of small clients. And so I went over there as one of, you know, the first couple people to work there and really just started moving up the ranks. And, and it really just, it became a thing where uh, working the REO came natural. And this was at a time when, you know, we were actually calling agents to, to convince them to give us a valuation and promise that we'll get you a listing if you'll just do this one for me, please. I just need this valuation. So it's funny to think back on it that at that point, you know, I'm, I'm, dialing and just managing, getting people to do free valuations for us so that we can scrub them. And then from there, just moved into being an asset manager, uh, really was only a pre-list coordinator for about a month. And then they put me into an asset manager spot. One of our asset managers actually got fired and they just said, hey, here's here's his whole portfolio, manage it through closing. So it was like drinking from the fire hose, just trying to figure it out as I went and it just started flowing. It just started making sense. Uh, within a couple months, I was the top one of the top asset managers for Green River and then started working in different departments there. Started working with the executives to create policies and procedures and to create training manuals. Like at that time, the systems that we were using to manage our REOs in-house, we didn't have a training manual for. We didn't have any way to tell our agents how to actually go in and complete a BPO or anything like that. So I started working with the top executives to 
create this training manual and then kind of talked myself into positions based on skills I didn't have. Like I created a mock dashboard and they thought I had all these Excel skills to build this dashboard. So they're like, great, make it functional. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So. Yeah. Oh crap, yeah. I gotta learn Excel. I've <laughs> gotta learn, so I'm, I'm literally reading like dashboards for dummies and I still have it. Uh, and it worked out that I started creating reports. And as I started creating reports, I could see where we were being inefficient. And that led to getting into where I was no longer an asset manager and I was a sales manager and I was watching over my team. And we were working for Chase and EMC and we started winning awards for, for them as the top outsourcer. That led to other opportunities uh, with no experience. They, they transitioned me into the eviction department and they said, take it over because we weren't getting, it was like a bottleneck. Everything was starting to come into eviction and bottlenecking with 2,500 assets that just were sitting there and nothing was moving through. So I took the eviction department over, uh, spent a little over 12 months there and we really uh, did something brand new. Instead of having the eviction coordinator manage the cash for keys side and the eviction side, we actually split it up. And I said, look, let's compensate the cash for keys people like salespeople and let them go after this aggressively and follow up. And we started vacating more properties. I think we went from, it was a 12% vacate rate and we were over 35% by the time I left. Uh, and then it just kept snowballing from there. It went to uh, Texas to take an opportunity with VRM. When VRM won the VA account, went there and helped them write all the policies and procedures, develop the system, develop the training, and then we rock and rolled for three years. We were selling uh, between me and, and the other operations managers. We were moving 12 to 1300 assets a month, every month, cool. and just rocking and rolling and just recovering uh, just an immense amount of money for the VA. And did that for three years uh, and then decided I want to get on the traditional side. So left that, went traditional and here we are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. <clears throat> so traditional meaning um, you decided to jump into the real estate side become a, a licensed real estate agent. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, the cool thing about you, dude, is you've had experience in every angle from it. So there's really nothing that you're not an expert at when it comes to REO. Yeah, you know, and I think that was one of the big advantages is walking into it and basically being like a sponge, right? So like, I remember uh, my wife and I, before we had kids and it was like, look, this this is a great, it's a great business. REO is a great business. Mm -hmm. There, there's so much, so many benefits to it, right? Like it's, it's not just serving the client, it's serving the community, right? Yeah. When, when you go in and you rehab a home and you remove that stigma, you save property values, you help put other people to work, right? Like you put these prop pres companies to work, you put title companies to work. Like it's such a great environment and a great business to be in. And when I got into it and I saw that, my wife and I said, hey, we're gonna run incredibly hard at this. And we did, and that's, that's what we did. And so we were open to anything. They came to me at one point and said, what would you do with HOA department? I said, this is how I'd manage it. And they're like, great, take it over. Great, now we're learning <laughs> HOA. Uh, code violations, same thing. Hey, we're getting killed on code violations. What can we do? We put a plan together, we implemented it. Great, now we know code violations. And so it really worked out incredibly well going into to VRM because there was that, that experience, right? Understanding how cash for keys and the eviction timelines not only affect like days on market, but affect selling cycles, right? Like if we can't vacate a property in the spring and the summer, and I get into fall and winter with it, now I'm less likely to sell it during those months, especially if I'm in like a cold weather environment, right? So by being open and understanding how every single piece fit, uh, it, you know, it was definitely a benefit to me and then also to my team because I could teach them that. But uh, one of the gaps that we saw definitely was the the lack of training and not just on the uh, operational side. Like I, I, you and I have talked about this, but I actually ran an REO 101 webinar where they shut down the entire floor and they sent over the closers, the HOA, they sent over accounting because nobody knew what we did with REO. And the biggest joke I made going into this is I said, hey, guys, REO is super simple. I'm going to tell it to you. It's just one step. Here you go. We board an asset. A miracle happens and we sell it. That's it. It's yep. three steps, right? <laughs> because nobody knew what everybody else did, right? So uh, huge advantage to, to really move up and impact REO. Uh, and then coming out of it, realizing that there's no, you know, like I went, I went back to visit my friends in Dallas after two years on the traditional side. And I'm sitting with my, my former peers. We were all operations managers. I've been in all the meetings with them. And uh, it's the same complaints. When I left two years ago, it was the agents don't know what they're doing on this account. 
And so I was talking to him, I said, but it's, it's been five years. How do they not know? There's no training in place. And so that started a new transition to say, okay, how, how, can, how can the experience that I've had in REO benefit these agents and my peers and my friends? Yep. Yeah, and you, you, your experience has been on the opposite side of my experience. My experience yeah. was, it was, of course, as the agent, um, you know, over, over the years, you know, we've worked, represented over 35 banks and then and, and sold thousands of REOs. Um, and you're right, dude, there is zero yeah. training. I mean, there, it's like, here, here's our playbook. Um, and you're expected to know how this stuff is done. And I, I, I get it to an extent. It's like, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, me as a real estate agent, if I go on a traditional listing appointment and I meet with this seller and I get their listing, they're not expected to tell me how to do my job. I'm expected as the professional right. to know how to do the job. Um, and, and asset managers are, are almost the same way, you know, right? Where, where they expect their agents to know what to do. And because, dude, there is zero. I mean, there, there's some training, you know, right? But, but nothing that is um, in-depth enough to yeah. set up an agent for success. I mean, agents, we, you work so hard to get into REO and then immediately you're set up for failure. Yeah, and, and you hit it right on the head. I think that was one of the most challenging things about being in the operations side is I saw some very good agents, very talented agents, basically get blacklisted because they didn't understand the game. They didn't understand what was expected of them. And when they couldn't meet those expectations, they were taken out of the system or they just gave up out of frustration when really they were starting to set themselves up to, to really be fed for a lifetime. Like that's the thing I love about REO. You talk about a listing presentation. You know, I can spend a ton of money on the traditional side now and I'm doing marketing and I'm working my sphere of influence and I'm doing all this stuff just to beat the bush and flush out this listing, this opportunity to list a home. If I do that same effort and build a relationship with an REO vendor, they're gonna feed me listings every single month. Yeah. And some month it's gonna be you know, more than I can handle and I'll right. figure out a way to handle it. And some months it may trickle, but I'm getting business consistently. And then, like you said, we're recession proofing the business, right? That there's gotta be multiple streams. If we're only expecting to feed ourselves from one avenue, if that dries up, there's nowhere to go. REO is always gonna be here. Until people make their payments 100% of the time, REO is gonna be here. Like yeah. it's just a fact, it's always gonna be there. So. Uh, for me, it's a great it's a great spot to be in. Uh, but exactly what you're talking about, the training. So I did a BPO before you and I met, right? So I'm doing a BPO for Goodman Dean, and as I'm this walking, this was like yesterday. This was yesterday. This yeah. was yesterday morning. So I'm like trying to prep everything to fly out, and I get this notification. I'm like, yeah, I can go do it. It's just a drive by. So I hurry and cruise down to go do this BPO. And as I'm walking through the forum, there's all these unwritten rules and expectations that are hiding within that BPO form that you would have no idea about. Like one example, it says, give me a quick sale value. What's a quick sale value? Like, how do you know? How do you yeah. know what a quick sale value is? Uh, I've seen agents that put, uh, they would do an adjustment on their BPO and they'd do a $15,000 REO adjustment. What's that for? Right. Right? Rub me the wrong way, I call them, ball them out. They don't wanna fix it, they're out of my network. These are the things they didn't know. They didn't know how to do this. And so it was funny walking through this BPO and I was thinking about, you know, the conversations we've had about, about training and what training is available. And I'm thinking about my friend, my friends in Texas and their frustrations with training. And I'm walking through this BPO and I say, yeah, how would somebody know what a quick sale value is? How would someone know how to do this repaired value or that your as is and repaired value need to match up unless the repairs exceed a certain amount? Like, how do they know this? And they don't, yeah. right? So it's a chance to help people understand yep. more. Yeah, Love it, dude. And, and I know we're gonna get deep into a lot of different things today for the listeners, um, you know, uh, give them some ideas of, um, you know, how asset managers, uh, what they're looking for, yep. uh, um, you know, how you can go out there and serve and support them at the highest level and, and how to get into Oreo. We're gonna hit on all those things today, but, um, you know, uh, just, just out of curiosity, dude, because when you, um, cause some people that might be listening might be like, ah, that doesn't work in my market. You know, sure. you know, Ben lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. He, he worked in Texas, like, you know, right. But when you're working for a company like VRM with VA, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a nationwide, like oh, you're, yeah, you're, you're in, you know, uh, uh, right. assets that are extreme cold to, I mean, every, in, every, all of the country. Yeah. Yeah. And you're exactly right. So, uh, to speak to that, when I was an asset manager, that was one gripe I had. I was in rural Tennessee. That was my market. And my, my uh, KPI, my key performance indicators, how I was bonused was the same as somebody in Los Angeles. And it was the same as somebody in Phoenix. Uh, 
Yeah. And we would talk about that and we would say, you just, you list it, you're going to get all these cash offers. And that's, it's funny because I see the same thing happening in real estate today where people think you just stick a home on the MLS and it sells. And there's a lot more to it than that. You can still leave money on the table if it's not valued right. That's the key to REO, right? So I, I, I look at it and I say, okay, absolutely rural market. Let's say there's four of us in this room. Let's say we're the only people that live in this town, right? We're, we're the only people here and they give me a listing. Well, some of us is, some, one of us is gonna buy that home for a dollar, right? Extreme example, no one's gonna sell for a dollar. One of us would buy it for $10. One of us would buy it for 100. One would buy it for 1,000. Somewhere between $1 and $10 million is this value that the people that live in that area will pay for that home. That's the value an REO agent brings, not to sit down and just do a valuation or to do a broker price opinion. It's saying, I know my market, I know my buyers, I have access to buyers, here's what they will pay for this home if you wanna get it sold, yep. right? And uh, that's how you survive in the smaller markets. We, uh, we sold an asset, we, avoid, we avoided an asset going aged because we figured out that the challenge with the area was that people didn't like driving it and gas prices were high. Great home, people loved it too far from the city. We offered a $2,500 gas card to anybody that bought it and we sold it within seven days. Yep. Done, right? So it's, you can figure out your market, Yep. right? Yep. So it's a little harder sometimes, but once you do that, you also add more value and those agents stick out to me. I and mean, I've worked with thousands of agents and it's the agents that overcame tough things to help me bonus and help me get rid of these assets that stick out of my head and I'll forever feed them business no matter where I go. Yep. Yeah. Love it, man. So, um, you know, when you uh, start with your intro, you said that you were a, a part of the problem. Oh, yeah. And then you became a solution to the problem. So now that you're you're a, a real estate agent and you're killing it, dude, right? Yep. And then this podcast isn't about you building your traditional business. We'll, we'll have to do a second podcast on that. But I mean, I think your first year, I mean, you're, you're doing what most agents can't do in a 20 year career, dude, right? I mean, you're, you're just absolutely yeah, slaying it. Yeah. Um, uh, right now. So, um, but with the things that you're seeing that are taking place, right? Um, going back when you, when you said you were part oh, of the yeah. problem on the lending side, yeah. because people forget, and we're seeing this now, we're seeing, yeah. oh, we'll give money to 580 FICO scores. I mean, we had a closing oh, yeah. not too long ago on a team where um, somebody got a government grant. They ended up getting the house. It was zero, fi I mean, 100% financing. So they had no, no skin in the game at all. They got their earnest yep. money back and end up getting 15 grand back in their pocket oh, geez. right from the from the grant right okay. so you know i mean i don't know if it's as i shouldn't say i don't know if it is as lax i mean it definitely isn't is lax where everything was you know stated no you know whatever but it's getting pretty damn lax it's again getting, it's and, getting and lax. you know you look at the the economy today there's 900,000 less jobs today than the war before the start of the last recession the middle class is 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 i mean the, the median income for the middle class is right. i mean just very rapidly declining yep. um like i think this whole economy that we've we've this recovery has been artificial in the first place mm -hmm. like what are some of these similarities or red flags you're seeing right now like where right now is the time agents better be prepping themselves for for reos for short sales um because it's coming yeah i think you hit it right on the head the number one thing you see is you start relaxing the guidelines if, if you have to go a, a traditional route and go 5% down, even if the seller's picking up your closing costs, and you're going 5% down, let's easy numbers, let's say a $200,000 property, you're putting $10,000 down. When push comes to shove, you're gonna fight to not walk away from that property because that's money you've invested, right? You had to work for that, you had to save for it, you had to plan, you had to fret for it, you had to source it, you had to do all these things. Back in 2007, 2008, I mean, there are jokes in the industry. When you talk to any loan officer back then, they say, oh, I could get anybody approved. I could get anybody approved. But these are the loan officers that are coming in to pitch us now. And they say, hey, guys, I can go down to a 580. I can do 100% financing. I can do one day out of bankruptcy and still finance you. I can do two years from short sale or foreclosure, and I can finance you. So what we're seeing is we're seeing this cycle back to people who lost their homes currently are buying again. And what lesson did they learn? Nothing. I mean, we actually did, uh, there are some credit agencies that did forgiveness, credit forgiveness. Yep. If you went through a foreclosure, it wasn't your fault. It's fine. Your credit's fixed. Go buy a new house. So now they come back in. And in my area, we have Utah Housing. Utah Housing is an FHA program where they'll pick up the second as, a, as a, they'll finance the second in for you. Well, now I go out and do my job and I get a seller to pay your closing costs. I did 500 earnest money that you're getting back. What's to keep you from walking away if you decide you don't like the neighborhood or the job market turns. Uh, I helped a family 
that, that I really liked. It was a young family. We did that exactly the scenario I set up. Two hundred thousand dollar home, two hundred fifty dollar earnest money. Like I got the earnest money to almost nothing. Uh, less than a year later, they're getting divorced and they have no equity. So what are they gonna do with the house? Neither one of them wants it. What's yep. gonna happen to the house? Sell. There's no room for me to go in and help sell, right? It's gonna go through the short sale process, and so it's one that we're monitoring to say, you know, save it, but it's probably gonna go that route. As as competitive as it is for us as realtors in the market right now, it's just as competitive for loan officers and it's just as competitive for banks who have to do better profits than they had last year. They're just gonna start laxing the guidelines, right? We're starting to see that too. We're starting to see self-employed, great, one-year bank statements. That's how stated income goes. That's how Nina started. That's how NoDoc started, was laxing that and saying, hey, that's okay, we'll just go a year, just state your income. And it always seems to start with you know, lower LTVs you relax the guidelines, you lower the LTV, just say, hey, look, we'll do no income verification, but at 60% LTV, then 70, then 80, then 90, then 95, and then we're right back to where we started, yep. right? And then you add to that that there's this housing market frenzy and people are starting to remove the appraisal contingency. And when you start doing that, you start inflating values artificially. Uh, and then they're coming up with the cash close. Well, if they run to a situation where they have to get out of the house, it's not gonna appraise because they overpaid for it. My market's not as extreme as like a San Francisco, right? We were yeah. talking the other day about people going in and, and spending $700,000 more than list price. That's extreme. But in San Jose, we helped a buyer moving from San Jose that sold their house 100,000 over list, uh, no appraisal contingency, $100,000 earnest money, non-refundable. That's artificially inflating the market. Values can't sustain it. Yeah, right? and what scares me, dude, is, is the job market so the job market is less stable mm -hmm. than than during the last bubble, you know, right? And we're definitely in a bubble, right? We've got yeah. high, record high real estate prices, record high stock market prices. Um, the job market's very unstable today, mm -hmm. and people are more debt than they've ever been. Oh yeah, you know, right? So you got yeah. fifty percent of, of Americans now with uh, uh, um, medical debt, forty percent with student loan debt. Um, 72 plus month auto loans are all time highs, yeah. you know, right? The average household's 15 grand in credit card debt. 76% um, of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, meaning they lose their job, there's no savings, they're instantaneously relying on government aid, and they're, they're out there getting houses, you know, right? Um, yeah. As you talked about, and it's easier for a lot of these people to get into a house and purchase a house and, more ex uh, uh, and, and less expensive than it is to go get a rental. Oh, absolutely. So like you said, man, there, there's no skin in the game. And, and with, with it just being um, so unstable, man, it's, um, you know, I think we could be in for some, some scary times. But if you prep yourself correctly, you know, I mean, you and I both did very, very well during the last market crash. If you yep. know how to adapt, your, your business does not, never needs to be in a vulnerable state if you know how to, to move, shift, change, and adapt, right? Exactly, yes. So, you know, that, that kind of talks to the importance of, of why realtors need to, to get in, right? Um, great market and, and, and a great niche to get into. So then that kind of leads me to the next question of, um, of, and I know there's a lot of different ways and you have like these like five proven, effective, amazing ways. Um, and I know we don't have time to go through all five of those. I think we're gonna do some advanced training, um, yeah. some free training that we're gonna, gonna give a, a, away for free um, on those five ways. Um, but give us an idea of you know, a couple of your top ways to get in for those that are listening. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, and, and it's, it's really fun to look at it because there are, so the advantage that, that, uh, that the webinar has is looking at the market's changed, even in the REO world, like how you get in has changed. Uh, it just one, we had an agent event one time, everybody wanted to see this guy, Jason. That's all anybody wanted to see when they got there, they wanted to see Jason because they saw his name come over on assignments. Jason was an admin and everybody went over to sell Jason, like give me more business. Yep. He was just an admin. His yeah, name no was just auto, was auto on maker. the email. It was so funny. <laughs> Poor Jason, dude. <laughs> but that market has transitioned. And uh, like you said, the, the stuff that we have is way too in depth because like the, the asset manager is not the first point of contact a lot of times to get in, but then they're your most important person once you actually get in. So uh, 
yeah, the, the, the webinar actually goes into a lot of non-traditional ways. But I would say the first thing that somebody has to do to get in is you have to be able to be noticed, right? That's what you have to do. You have to register with companies. Now, um, with part of our webinar, we have 100 REO companies and BPO outsourcers that you can register with. It's got the registration link to take a lot of the guesswork out. But that's the first step. If people don't know that you're available for listings, you're not going to get them. That's the very first step. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there's ways to fill out that application that will set you higher up than somebody else, right? Even though it may just be a handful of questions, your answers are going to automatically disqualify you or put you in a position where they want to explore the opportunity of working with you. So uh, that's one thing we teach is that you have to fill out the applications the right way, but the number one thing you have to do is fill out the applications. Uh, the second thing you have to do is you have to keep filling out the applications and follow up. One of the number one mistakes I see is someone will submit an application and they'll say, oh, it's too crowded. They've got too many agents. They're not hiring. They're not bringing anybody on because I submitted the application one time and nobody got back to me, right? You have to be persistent. It's like anything else. You have to keep putting it in because when that need comes, they need to know that you're there. But if you've given up, I wouldn't want to work with you, right? Because REO, REO you need agents that are dependable. And if you're going to give up at the first time, I'd rather just go to somebody who's diligent and persistent. So the number one thing is you have to make yourself available, but you have to submit applications the correct way, and then you have to follow up on those correctly. Okay, Like when I was an asset manager, uh, I would get two to 300 emails a day. You can't just keep sending me thank you. Like I would actually yell at people if they sent me an email response that said, got it, or thank you. Like if I told somebody to do something and they said, thank you, got it, on it, I'd be like, please stop sending these to me. Just if I tell you to do something, just go just away get and get it Show done. Show me the result. Nobody knows that, right? So that's the first thing is that there's a right way to go after traditional business by just signing up, being persistent in the correct way, and filling out the application in the correct way, right? Uh, Non-traditionally. So along the same lines of actually knowing how to fill out an application is attend industry events. That's probably the most important thing you can do is face-to-face -face time. So as an asset manager, if, if, I, if all I see is your name on a piece of paper, you really don't mean that much to me. And if we talk on the phone, there's, there's more of a relationship. But once we actually meet face to face, you're a person, right? So attending industry events is key. Dallas has a big one every year, Five Star. There's Rio Mac. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities that people don't know about, like uh, at VRM. So VRM is just outside of Dallas. And when they have the Five Star, VRM actually invites agents over to their office most people don't know that. So they don't go and they don't get a chance to do FaceTime with all these asset managers. Like they actually walk us down there and we meet the agents that have come over there and they do lunches and all this stuff. Huge advantage getting FaceTime. So you have to go to these events, but there's also a proper way to meet asset managers, right? Like a lot of people I've seen whenever I work those trade shows and I work the booths, uh, I would have agents come up and, and they would, they would want to voice their complaints. They'd want to air their grievances. They'd want to complain about their market or they'd want to complain about a situation or a scenario or, you know, uh, a valuation we didn't go with that they put together. And it was this gripe, gripe, gripe. And they can't, you know, when you, when you attend an industry event, there's a way to attend it. You're a salesperson. You're there to sell. Same way with filling out an application online. You're selling yourself just on paper. Attending an industry event, there's a certain way to do it. And we go over that in the webinar too. How do you go in and make an immediate impression with asset managers and with the vendor managers to set yourself up to get more business down the road? Because sometimes it's not a one-shot thing. It's yeah. just laying the groundwork. Yeah, and I love that you brought up the the you know the human connection element because at the end of the day, that's what it's all mm -hmm. about, right? I mean, I think a lot of people perceive banks, asset managers as like you know this big business, this corporation, and yeah. the connection doesn't matter. But you know, just like the 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 NAR stat for buyers right now, 66% of buyers go with the first agent they meet with and connect with in person. That human connection is huge, yep. and and now you aren't just you know a name that's in the system. Right. Um, you have that connection with it. So love it, dude. So okay. So once you get into REO, um, kind of walk us through because man, when when, when you and I were, were creating this training this training product, um, which we'll talk to you guys about later here. Um, I, I've sold a lot of REO, right? Not near to the, the level that you have, have on, on your end of it, but um, you know, it was, we were one of the top REO teams in the nation and I'm watching your content and I learned, dude, I learned <laughs> so much stuff 
that I had no idea because we don't. Like, yeah. it's on the agent side, yeah. we don't know the internal workings. We don't know, like, I don't, my asset manager's not coming to me like, here is exactly how I am bonused. Here's exactly right. how you make me more money. Right. Um, here's exactly how, like, you you become my number one uh, biggest fan of, of an uh-huh. agent, you know? And I don't know if they're not allowed to say that. They're probably not, you know, they're who not. knows? Um, uh, but but walk us, you know, give us give us some kind of um, intel on that. Like, like, how can we go out there once we get in to make sure because, dude, we, we want to be that rock star. Yeah, one. absolutely. The, the number one piece of advice that I would give is that you have to treat every asset manager like they're an individual client. In fact, you have to treat everybody within that outsourcer like an individual client. It can become an incredibly big juggling process. What a lot of people don't know is that the asset managers are actually given a lot of freedom because, like an agent, like we hire former agents a lot of uh, asset managers have to actually go through and get their license and then just place it inactive, right? We hire people that know how to manage their business and these guys take it like it's their own business because they're the, the highest compensated people outside of executives. The asset managers make the most money. I know some asset managers, I kid you not, that at, at one point were making three to $400,000 a year. So much so that the company that they were representing came back and said, you've got to change your structure because these guys are making so much money, we can't get people to come to work, right? The asset managers have that much play. They take their business as serious as you take your business and as serious as I take my business. They get to work early, they work at home, they work on the weekends. If you're trying to treat every single asset manager like the same person, you're gonna fail. That was one of the number one things. Countless escalations came to my desk where someone would say, a little backstory before I get into it. Uh, we would actually, at VRM, we would actually change asset managers from territory every 12 months. Like we would take a whole team and we would move them out of their states and we'd put them with a different ops manager. We'd leave the ops manager in place because we knew our territory. The system is built around the agent, the REO agent, not being honest and kind of trying to take advantage of the bank. And that's why the executives decided we're going to pick everybody up and we're going to move them so that they're less likely to to put themselves in vulnerable situations, right? So I'd move everybody over into my territory and then I'd start getting a flood of call in the, from the agents because we're not moving agents, we're just moving asset managers. And the agents are so upset that, you know, that Tom wants a BPO done this way, but Jill wanted it done this way. And they're upset because they don't want to do it the way Tom wants it, they want to do it the way Jill wanted to do it. By not realizing that Tom is their client and Jill is their client, They soured their relationship with Tom. Now, every asset that he works on with them, he wants them off of it. As soon as they come over, as soon as he sees their name, he wants them off of it. Because they didn't take the time to just have a conversation and represent that asset manager as an individual client. I can tell you, if you came to me as an agent, I can tell you how I want my BPOs done, right? You're going to have the basic framework. You have to give me three sold comparables within the last six months three active comparables that aren't short sales. Like, they're a basic standard framework. But then within that, it's totally subjective to me, right? As an asset manager, if I tell you, if I say, hey, Josh, I don't care if these aren't the same style home. I want all my homes in the same neighborhood. I want them within a half mile radius. I don't care if they're the same size. I want to know that neighborhood specifically. Those are the comps you need to give me because I'm the one that's scrubbing your BPO. And if you can't give me those comps, I'm going to reject your BPO. And if I reject your BPO too many times, I'm going to just ask to give it to somebody who will do the BPO the way I want it. On the other hand, now you've got Jill. She wants everything that's the same. She wants a ranch rambler every single time. If you have to go two miles down the road, she doesn't care. She wants that ranch rambler. We're all responsible for our business and our results. So however we get the BPO done, it's very subjective. So you have to treat people like a client and basically have that conversation and say, how do you want me to do this? How do you want me to communicate to you, right? I got two to 300 emails a day. I hated answering the phone. But one of the worst things that ever happened to me is when somebody this is so dramatic. It's not the worst thing that ever happened to me. But <laughs> one thing that would really get me upset is if somebody sent me an email, made a phone call, I didn't answer. They called again and sent me another email because I'm managing my day. I'm in charge of my portfolio. Like unless you have the sheriff at the house right now and something bad is going down, there's no need for that. But because they don't understand the pressure, they don't understand that I'm managing 400 assets. They think, oh, he's just not answering the phone. Well, no, I'm managing my pipeline. So, uh, having that conversation with the asset manager and understanding how they work, but not just for you, your support staff has to know that too, right? If you have this great relationship with me, there are some very tedious tasks in BPO. Like in REO, they're incredibly 
tedious tasks. I was doing this BPO yesterday and I'm like, this is this. Why can't they just do an IDX feed so I don't have to put in all this information about each asset? So the bigger players, the people who are serious about their business, they start expanding. They get assistants that can do some of this data entry stuff, right? But if you haven't trained them on what the expectation of the asset manager is, you may have built this great relationship and then they don't deliver the results you're looking for. Like if I want certain BPO photos and then you send somebody out to take the photos and they don't know what my expectation is, they're going to deliver the wrong results. I think that's the most important thing that you can do. It's, it can be challenging to get in. Sometimes it's not challenging to get in. So, but once you get into REO, that's how you build your business is you see each individual asset manager as a client and you work to please that client. Yep. Yeah. 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 Love it, man. Um, and you know, we were, we were talking about this over dinner last night, but, um, yeah, it's like, the when you when you get in with a bank right or or an asset management company they give you hey here's our operations manual they need to follow but then you really have to almost recreate an operations manual for each asset manager because like you said everybody's so different you got to go to their style and as an asset manager man i mean i'm just curious because i can't imagine it was a lot how many agents called you and were like hey ben man i want i want to you know make sure that i'm doing the best job i can for you i i want to i want to you know solve you i don't want to create problems i want to uh-huh. solve your problems i want to make sure you're successful um is there any constructive criticism that you can give me is there any you know like h- how do i how do i set you up to win in your position uh it, it's funny you say that five out of five. 10 plus thousand out assets of, yeah in- <laughs> At, at, at having sold, I mean, you know, 10,000, I think the number is closer to 11,000 assets, five, five agents that stand out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's crazy. That I still remember, right? Like, uh, yeah, because no one's doing that. Everybody's just trying to run. And, you know, to your point, when you say uh, the manual, like a VRM, we didn't have a manual. Yeah. Three years in, we didn't have a manual and we didn't because we were still evolving the system and nobody wanted to take the time to write a manual that just may change. Right. So now I'm holding you to an expectation that I can't even document, right? Yeah. It's a moving target, an unknown moving target. But no, to your point, uh, a handful of people reached out. And because of that, those are the people that whenever I changed accounts or went to another shop, the first thing I did is I went to vendor management. I said, is this person on the account? No, they're not. I need them set up. I need them in my area. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. Love it, dude. So then, um, you know, I know there's a lot of a lot of things that go into it. I know in the training you go really, really deep into, you know, KPIs and, you know, a lot of different things. Right. but like, what, what's like the worst thing um, uh, to have happen as an asset manager? Is it aged assets? It's aged assets. Yeah, it's aged assets. Uh, the, the uh, yeah, aged assets are nightmares on the inside for a couple of reasons. Uh, first aged asset meeting I ever went to, I had been an asset manager for a month and I didn't take the time to go through and scrub my portfolio. I thought it was just a normal meeting. We all walk in. So here's one of the first things to understand. If you have aged assets, and you're an asset manager, you have to go in there and wait for everybody to go through each one of their assets before you get to do yours. So now I'm spending three hours in a meeting and I'm gonna have to go catch up on voicemails, emails, and all my tasks because I've got aged assets and I had to sit in there. If you don't have aged assets, you don't have to go to the meeting, right? So the number one thing is it's a time killer. But I went to my first one, not really prepared, and I was the first one to go up. And on the other end of the line was the head of Chase and the owner of Green River Capital and they started walking through each asset. Why didn't this asset sell? I don't know. I don't know, I don't have any idea. And I got lit up. What was the agent's value? How did the agent miss the value? What's the market strategy? Did we do repairs? Why didn't we do repairs? How many showings? And just got chewed up. And I almost walked away from the business after that. Like I never, I just felt like shit. I walked away from this asset manager, at this age meeting saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't belong in this, this is horrible. And what's funny is that that was like my first month as an asset manager. You fast forward seven years later, I still feel like that when I leave an aged meeting. When you have the owner of the company come sit in and you've got the head of the bank sitting there saying, why can't you sell my asset? That's a tough spot to be in, yeah. right? Aged asset meetings are the worst, but it also, it doesn't just impact my time, it actually impacts my income too. So you mentioned KPIs. So the KPIs is a key performance indicator that we have internally. Some outsourcers will roll out a broker scorecard. And if they do, most likely the performance of the broker is gonna mirror the KPIs that we have for the client, right? But one of them is, a lot of them are around aged, average days on market, average days in inventory, percentage of portfolio aged, number of assets over 240 days in inventory or whatever number they set. So whatever bonus I'm gonna make, if I'm an asset manager and I'm making, you know, depending on the salary, if I'm making um, 25 to $60 per asset, right? 
they're going to start taking money away if I fail those. And those are the those are the number one things that we fail on is aged. If you look at the compound effect of having aged, it's now got an asset that's sitting exposed to the market and it's vacant. So now I have more code violations that I have to deal with. I've got to deal with winterization when it becomes time to winterize it. Uh, I've got to keep having this prop press company on it that may be, they may be a flat fee prop press company and they don't want to go cut the grass anymore because they've been doing it for a year and they're not making any more money on it. So now it's this headache for me to try to find somebody that can go take care of it. So aged 100%. Yeah, biggest um, pain in the ass. For, for on the agent side, you know, and and I mean, so many because you know, it, just agents congregate and they talk, and yeah. and you know, I've been in rooms with so many aged uh, or so many realtors, REO realtors, where it's like, oh, well, I'm getting lit up because these aged assets, and and I can't do anything about it because they're they're pricing it at 110 percent of appraisal value or wh- whatever, and and I'm looking at like their marketing strategy. You know, right? They got shitty photos right. with their with their cell phone. They're not pushing it. They're not right. doing addition. They don't treat it like a traditional seller client, like they would treat it. They're not doing open houses. They're not, right. um, you know. So, so there are many ways that realtors can, you know, there there are things that a realtors control, right? Yeah, yeah, there are. So I think that to to your point, if they're listing a high, like the number one thing I always say is that your job is to be a valuation expert. It, it really is, and they're not always going to set it like some. Some clients, mainly hedge funds, will have criteria that says, hey, no matter what values we get, we're going to list at 110%. That's possible. But the people in the business, when that happens, it's it's like doing a presentation to a seller. You're saying, right, I understand you listed high. I told you this is where the value needs to be to sell. You've got to be confident in that value, though, because once they give it to you, you have to sell, right? Um, but I saw very few people that ever treated an REO like a traditional sale. I didn't see anybody leverage it the way that it could. The way, looking at the things that you teach in your boot camp, I look at that, the first time I walked through that, I thought if people had done this in REO, they would have exploded their business, especially when it was big and you're managing like 100 assets, absolutely. Yeah. But nobody was, it was put a sign in and this is what this is what drove me crazy. So there are outsourcers, well, more specifically the banks that have come out and they said, hey, look, we need to start repairing more assets, right? They want to be good neighbors. They want to increase neighborhood stability. And so they actually have, as part of the KPI, they have percentage of assets that were repaired. Some of these banks are as high as 50%. They want to see half of their portfolio with at least $5,000 of repairs. So our standard is we go, hey, that's carpet and paint. We'll carpet and paint everything. $5,000. So I look at it and say, so an agent that has that listing the bank is improving your storefront for you. Yeah. They're saying, hey, forget it. I'm going to give you new carpet, new paint, right? It's not going to be three-tone paint. It's probably going to be two-tone paint. It's going to be FHA-grade carpet, but it's still going to be, I'll give you this. You want new linoleum? Great, you got it. You want me to do a sales clean? I'll pay the people to sales clean it. You want me to cut the grass? I'll pay the vendor that goes out and cuts the grass. They are managing your storefront for you, and nobody's doing open houses. Nobody's staging it. One person staged it. So, you know, my wife, Kim, was in REO with me. Her favorite agent is in, in Florida because she would stage every asset and she would sell them. Yeah. Kim loved that. But nobody was doing that. Knowing who the investors are, doing an investor tour with REO assets to get not only new buyers, but also get listing opportunities. Because not every REO, like, there's a stigma with REO that they're all these run-down, broken houses, and they're not. Yep. Some REOs are fantastic. Like they're three, four hundred thousand dollar homes. I would love to have a listing in a four hundred thousand dollar neighborhood that I could put my sign up, that I could put my open house flags to, that I could walk the neighborhood and invite people. You know, with with uh, with your mega open houses, we walk the neighborhood, right? And I love the strategy. We say, hey, there's going to be a, a lot more cars here than you're used to. Just wanted to let you know we're just having this big open house, so don't call the police. That's just us bringing a lot of people to the neighborhood. Why can't you do that with an REO to walk through and say, hey, if there are problems with this home, my job is to protect your values. I'm going to make sure that the grass is cut. I'm going to make sure that nobody comes in here and uses this house like no squatters are going to come in. Kids aren't going to come in here and treat it like a clubhouse. If you could just keep an eye out on them for me. And then if you know anybody who's looking to buy it, send them my way. Right. You know anybody who wants to move in this neighborhood, send them my way. And the bank just repaired it for you. You yeah. put any of your own money into it, right? But nobody's doing that. Nobody's yeah. doing that. So huge missed opportunity. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I, I would say, like, with, you know, like Fannie Direct as an example. I mean, there's very few properties 
um, that I've listed for them over the years that they have it went in and paint, carpet, a lot of times new appliances. At a minimum, I yep. mean, dude, they're, they're, they're 10 times nicer mm -hmm. than my regular traditional seller. And they're vacant, so I can be busting out open houses seven days a week. Yes. You can, you know, massive targeted Facebook ads. I mean, you know, you can leverage this where, where any bank asset that you get can easily equate to four or five additional sales. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you hit it right on the head. So I have a townhouse I'm listing right now that's a beautiful three bedroom townhouse, but it is owner occupied. They have kids. So we can't go in and we can't take care of the wall nicks because as soon as I go in and fix it, yeah. someone's going to just draw on it again. And the carpet needs to be replaced. Well, if that was an REO asset, I'm just telling them, hey, paint this for me. I need you to paint it. I need new carpet. And the minute you do, I have the nicest townhouse in the community to go build my network. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So to give agents, so we, so we talked about how to get in or some, some ways to get in. Mm -hmm. um, talked about uh, how to be successful once you're in. Um, kind of walk us through the overall uh, uh, process, just so agents know what to expect on the agent side. So like I get assigned this, I got the OCK check, BPO, yeah. MMR, so they can kind of uh, uh, understand what that looks like. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So it's always gonna depend on what services the outsourcer has set up. There are some that are there just to simply do valuations, right? That's, that's the scope. Uh, at some point, you're going to get the assignment. You're going to accept the assignment either through email or once you register through their task system, they're going to send you a task that says, here's a new assignment, do you accept it? Once you accept it, you're going to start getting the tasks. If we looked at the REO process and we broke it down high level, first thing you're going to have is your occupancy inspection just to see if the home's vacant. If it is occupied, we're going to go right to eviction. We're going to be tasked most likely to do cash for keys. Cash for keys, for people that don't know what cash for keys is, I think it's one of the best things uh, in the in the uh, REO world, hands down, it's a one-time payment to the occupants to vacate the property and leave it in broom swept condition. So not to repair it, just to take all their personal property, leave the house. Broom swept is literally broom swept, like just debris off the floor, not right? Strip it. Not strip yeah. it. Please leave your appliances. Uh, but it, it gives them a payment. It gives them an option and allows them to save face, right? That's the biggest thing. Is that the, some people le legitimately are experiencing hardships and. You can walk in, you can say, hey, look, here's $2,500. That's your first last month payment and a little bit of money to help move. We can vacate the property. It, it helps, you know, it helps the bank, helps everybody. But if you have cash for keys, that's the next option. Cash for keys and evictions will typically run at the same time because some people will, will uh, you know, kind of falsify their intentions. So, yeah, I want to do cash for keys and then they just string it out for 30 days and then they don't do it. Uh, if the, if the property is vacated via cash for keys, great. If not, it's going to go through the eviction process and eventually go to lockout, right? Once, once the lockout's done, uh, the agent would oversee the lockout. They actually go there. They'll meet with the sheriff. Depending on the state, they may have to hire the lockout crew to be there. Uh, and lockout's exactly what it sounds like. We are taking all the stuff from the house to the curb. Like It is not a pack your things. It's not make sure you have your family heirlooms. It is get your stuff. It's going to the curb. We're changing the locks right there. Uh, after that, we're going to do our initial services. That's going to vary depending on which outsourcer you're using. But it's typically we're going to make sure the grass is cut, the property is secure, which may mean boarding. We're going to rekey all the exterior doors. Uh, we're going to winterize the property depending on the time of year and where it's located. Uh, and then we're going to look for any environmental repairs or anything that's threatening the property. So if there's a big hole in the roof, we're going to want to repair that. Uh, once that's done, we do the initial services. The house is now vacant. It's completely cleared out. Now we can do our valuation. We do our best valuation, depending on what the outsourcer is looking for. Uh, sometimes they want to see traditional sales only. Sometimes they want one REO. So again, like we talked about with each client, that's going to vary. But you're going to do a BPO form, which is going to be your indication of what the value is. The asset manager is going to take that value with a secondary value. So either a, another BPO, possibly from like a BPO company, or an appraisal from an appraisal company. Scrub the values, they're going to determine the as-is strategy, I mean the as-is value, and then the final strategy. So like, do we make repairs, do we not make repairs? The agents will typically oversee the repair process. Once the repairs are completed, we go out, we list it. There's going to be certain verbiage that you have to have in the MLS, certain disclo documents, disclosures. You list it and, and then handle it like a tra traditional sale from there on out. Like we get offers in. If there's more than one, we go into a multiple offer process, a highest and best process. Once it goes under contract, it's really a traditional closing all the way through. The only exception is title. Like most of the time, if, if we don't have title, it may be a quick claim. So you right. may have to sell cash only. Uh, 
there can be reconveyances, which is a nightmare. So if the servicer, if the um, if the bank is not able to take title or to transfer title because something wasn't done prior to foreclosure, it may be reconveyed back to the servicer to, to resolve that. Otherwise, it's just a traditional closing and you're done. Yeah. So on the agent side, let's just let's just say the property is vacant, right? So okay. the agent side, I get my assignment. I'm going to go do my OC check, usually 24 hours, mm -hmm. try to make it same day always. Uh, um, but I'm going to do my OC check, vacant, rekey it. Um, then um, as initial services are happening, I'm going to do my BPO because usually it's you've got a few days to get it done. So you crank out your BPO. Um, then it's either going to be repaired or not repaired. Then you've got it marketed. But on the agent side from there too, I mean, you've got updated BPOs typically every 90, 90 days. days yep. You got your monthly market update reports, which is like a watered down BPO, but those are yeah. every 30 days. Um, also, you're expected to inspect that property every single week, document right. it, walk it every single week. You know, and of course, this stuff can be outsourced, right? I mean, mm -hmm. or, or I'm not going to say outsourced, delegated. Delegated, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't outsource this stuff to, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, what, like you want these people in house that work for you. Right. Uh, but this stuff can be delegated. Um, is there anything I'm kind of missing there that no. you would say agency be prepped for, uh, other than what we've already talked about? Yeah. So you have to be the the biggest difference between REO and traditional is you have to be ready to basically manage the expenses for the house, yeah. right? So. Back when, when you started, you fronted a lot of money for cash for keys. And that's kind of gone more to the outsourcers. They're, they're fronting more of that money. They're, making, they're cutting checks directly to the occupants and delivering it to the agent for all that. But you're still going to maintain your utilities. That's the biggest one. You're going to maintain the utilities. Most likely, you're going to pay past due utilities, past due water, past due sewer, and submit for reimbursement, possibly past due HOA fees. If there's code violations, you're going to review those, negotiate them down. And depending on the amount, you're going to front the money. And then depending on the amount of repairs, you may be fronting the money too. So that's that's the biggest thing to be prepared for is that there is a financial involvement. And then on top of that is how do you protect getting reimbursed, yeah. right? There are a lot of guidelines around that, that if you, uh, I know you've ran into this before, if your invoice is not submitted in a certain amount of time, you're not going to be reimbursed. There's no dollar amount to it. It could be anything. So. If you don't know the proper way to document your expenses, submit for reimbursement, you could actually be out money for the things that you're handling. So those are typically going to be all your utilities, past due expenses. Uh, the prop pres things are typically paid by the outsourcer. But if you're working with a smaller client, like you had 35 clients. If I'm working with the local credit union, I might have to front that money also, yeah. right? So when when I'm sitting with executives and we're deciding the PMP and we're looking at what is the vetting process for an agent, we typically want to look at their financials to see how many assets that they can they can handle, and that's going to vary. It's it's really going to vary. It's typically we had come up with a number and we said, look, it's going to be roughly twenty five hundred dollars that we're floating from time to time. So if I have access to $5,000, I'm going to float through two assets. I'm going to close those and build up my money till I've got more. But I've had, uh, yeah, I've had, outs I've had agents, really depending on how big they want to go their business, they just manage two assets and that's all they do. They want to float that. I've had some that are managing 50 assets, some that are managing 500 assets yep. and just floating different money. So the financial impact is the biggest one. Floating money and you've got to be responsible to get it back. Like that's the biggest thing. Like we can write a thousand dollar check and we can float that. But when it's rejected, now it impacts our business and our livelihood, right? Yep. So that's that's a big challenge just to be prepared for. Yeah. Yeah, it gets to a point where in the beginning, you know, you can kinda handle it because you're you're not you don't have a lot of assets, you know, right? But but you're you're big REO agents. Um, I mean, it gets to a point where, you know, we'd always kind of joke like, hey, I got to pay this person, you know, an in-house person 40 grand a year uh -huh. to chase down my money that I'm floating for these banks. But if you don't, it can break you, yeah, you know, right? Like we were talking absolutely. last night, I mean, at the peak, I mean, I had about a quarter million out. Yeah. Now that, that was an extreme, um, so I don't want that spook you guys <laughs> because that was back, you know, that was, that was, I mean, that was a long time ago, right? And that was, I mean, I was having a front so when you talk about the carpet and painting those repairs, I was having to front that. I was fronting cash for keys, and a lot of that's changed. Um, so, uh, all right, dude. So let's transition into 
REO University, man. So I know yep. this has been something you've wanted to do forever um, that uh, we recently partnered on. And uh, and when I say partner, you guys, um, Ben and I partnered on this, but but it's probably 80, 90% Ben, 10, 20% <laughs> me. And, and, you know, because Ben just goes so in depth with his knowledge base. And, and again, you guys, even with my experience, I was just, I was just blown away, dude. And, and exactly. a lot of my involvement is really just uh, um, piggybacking off of, of what Ben teaches in there, but from the agent lens, because we've, we've experienced this from two different angles, right? So yeah. the cool thing about the REO University is you're getting trained from somebody that had that massive amounts of, not just asset management experience, but as Ben said in his intro, every element of, of all REO, um, and then me being, you know, from the REO agent side, yeah. you know, how, how, how do you structure your team and, and, you know, different things on that angle, dude. So uh, um, kind of, cause I know you came to me with the product, right? Like I yeah. know you've been wanting to do this for a long time. Yeah. Like what, what inspired you so much to want to do this? Uh, pure frustration. And yeah. so <laughs> any, you know, and I think I should actually issue just a blanket apology. If, uh, if anybody was like, I've changed a lot of my tunes since I became a traditional agent because I didn't realize how tedious some of the stuff was and some of the problems I was creating for people on the VA account, we can't use dot loop or DocuSign. You have to use wet signatures, right? Yep. So if I have 40 offers, those are all wet signatures. If you can't spell the VA name right, I've got to reject every single one. And you know, until I actually got on the traditional side, I was like, big deal, go get it signed. And I'm like, I would hate to track all over town and get these things signed. So blanket apology to anybody if uh, you know, I pulled the trigger a little too quickly and, and fired you, but that's how asset managers think. That's how we work. In that environment, we say, if you can't do what I want you to do, I'm gonna find somebody who can. But that hasn't changed. Your, that your, has not changed at all. Has changed, My view has changed, but, but nobody everybody else, else. So agents need to be prepared no, for that, right? And, and really it's the agent's all. responsibility, man. You want to take it this is. on, it is your responsibility. It is. So what started this was, was me being passionate that there were so many good people that weren't doing the right thing. And it was hard for me to watch. Like, yeah, it's impacting my pocketbook. And that was frustrating. But it was also frustrating when someone just was trying hard and they didn't get it and they couldn't do it. And I was limited by what I could say, right? Uh, I've had agents that would come to me and they're chewing me up over a $25 reimbursement that nobody approved, but they thought that the home needed air fresheners. And they're saying, you should reimburse that. And I'm saying, I can't reimburse it. There's no line item. And they're calling me and they're calling my boss and they're calling the accounting. And I can't tell them this $25 asset, this $25 reimbursement is gonna cost you every single listing from here on out. Stop it. You've got to stop it. I couldn't say that in the operations role because as an operations manager, I couldn't come out and say, eat this expense. You're going to eat this one. I couldn't tell somebody how to structure their business. When they were saying, you know, no, I'm not going to get out there and board this up beforehand. I couldn't say, but you're renting a high rise office. That's a business expense. This is a business expense. I couldn't say any of that stuff. So it was really my passion that made me want to fix a lot of these problems. And if we rewind the clock back, Five years ago, I won a process improvement contest for Green River. It was, a, it was a contest for the whole company, 200 employees. And my solution was better training for the agents so that they can increase our efficiencies so that each asset manager can manage more assets and make more money. And we can go take these agents and we can go get more business because we have the best trained agents in the business. That was it. You won the years contest. Years ago, and I won the but, contest but, but for that. But they still didn't implement it. Nobody implemented anything. <laughs> Ne not implemented. And I think Green River does a better job than most people because at least once a year they have a big agent event and they actually get up on stage and try to talk to these things. But it's not, it's still politically correct. It's still find a nice way to tell people and dance around the issues. And, you know, I used to sit at my desk just completely frustrated. Why can't I just tell you to do this? Why can't I just, this is how I need you to do this. I want you to have this. And, and I've had agents that, that were good agents that I had to fire because they wouldn't change. They wouldn't do things the, the way that I wanted to. And, uh, you know, you're a mentor of mine. I've looked up to you ever since I started listening to your podcast when I just got into to traditional sales because here's a little insight for asset managers. We think that the job on the ground is easy. Right. Like, who are these guys? We're just handing you listings every single month and you're making bank. And we're sitting here and we're slaving away. That's what we think. I got on the traditional side and the first thing I said was, oh, shit. What am I going to do? How am I going to get business? Like. Yeah, I've sold 10,000 houses. I have never once generated a lead. How do I do this? This is scary. So I found you and I found the boot camp. And like you said, epic year, fantastic year. Totally blessed that we can do this. But it got me thinking that 
there's an opportunity because nobody's training these agents, right? And talking with my friends in Dallas and seeing that they're still not training, that people still aren't training this. And, and, and now you're in position with that. You had that frustration, but now the handcuffs are off. Yeah. So now you can be honest. You can, you can actually disclose and teach and train on those things that need to be disclosed and teach and train, but you weren't allowed to before. Yes. Uh, I can now tell the things that would have gotten me fired before because nobody can fire me because I don't work there, yeah. right? And with the timing, uh, you know, every non-complete, everything has expired. It's been two years. So there are no repercussions to actually saying this is how the industry is. And that's what I wanted to do was I wanted to pull the curtain back and say, here's the truth. You know, like the one, one of the things that gets me, that drives me absolutely nuts is when people just intentionally deceive other people or kind of lead them in. So uh, I don't know whether I can say it or not, but I'm not a fan of Planet Fitness at all. Right. Because the business model is based on people not going to the gym. Right. Right? It's the only way it can survive at $10 a month. But they're duped into it. And people go in and they think, I'm getting this good deal. I've got this gym. Now I'll walk away. And a business model is built on someone failing. And I hate that. In the REO world, a lot of the models built on the agent failing and having to find a new agent to replace them. The agents that do get it, that have just managed to get it. So, like, the interesting thing about REO is my training was very lax. It was just one of those things where once I got into it, it was like second nature. Like doing a BPO made sense. And for some reason, like when I do BPO, all my ADD calms down and I just focus on that BPO and I get it. I know how to do valuations, right? 10,000 assets, my net recovery, so my sale price to original list price was over 98% across all the assets. Like I got it. But not everybody gets it, but you can teach it, right? Yeah. You can teach it. Uh, and then also I think it's a responsibility. Like I have this information and nobody's training it. Yep. Nobody's doing it. And, and now as a, as a homeowner, if there's an REO in my neighborhood, I want somebody who's gone through my stuff to be representing that or me representing it rather than somebody that doesn't care about it and isn't going to do the right valuation. They're going to let it sit there and they're going to bring all the neighborhood values down. So I don't know how you package that together, but coming to you is because you've changed so many lives on their well not even just on the traditional side you've changed so many lives just for this gsd like the following and what people are doing just by following your example just to be around you is awesome but with your charisma and your ability to teach people i saw an opportunity that we could deliver more value because i don't know how to get to people right that was the biggest challenge i can sit down and i can talk aria with you all day and i can tell you everything that you want to know I've been in every department. I've been in charge of every department. I've been in meetings with the VPs and the CEOs and the owners determining how we're going to do policy and procedure and determining the next steps. But if I can't reach people, what good's the information? Yeah. It's not. So so that's <coughs> it. It's a perfect partnership of, of how can we help as many agents as possible? You're already doing that. I just want to I just want to piggyback on that and help more. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. really it. Love it. Well, and, and, and the cool thing like we talked about before is – You've got to be able to adapt and shift. Absolutely. You know, right? And I, I think a huge myth or misunderstanding a lot of agents have is that REOs, and I know you hit on this earlier, but they only exist in market crashes. No, they always they exist. Always they exist in more of abundance and in market crashes, but it's just like a traditional buyer. And so they always exist. Mm -hmm. I might have less traditional sellers in a market crash, but I'm going to have more short sales and REOs. And, and yeah, I mean, the product's REO University, um, but we do also have a lot of advanced short sell training in there. Right. You know, um, how, how to do a short sell listing presentation, how to get short sell clients, how to market to them, how, how to have success negotiating with the banks on the short sell side. So it's really everything distressed property. Mm -hmm. um, so in, inside the program, man, um, I know it's, you know, um, I mean, there, there's really nothing that isn't in there, you know, right. right? So it's, you know, how to get into the business, uh, um, uh, be successful getting in, but then everything from the, you know, all those, all those processes from how to handle evictions, how to handle trash outs, how to handle personal property evictions, how to do the BPO, how to, you know, grow your team within this. And yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't know if you had to give like your few minute, you know, a uh, uh, product pitch on what's included um, in, in there, you know, just give those that are watching, listen, what's, what's included. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing, first thing that you hit on is we're going to show you how to be well-rounded. We're going to take default all the way through to the eviction process. So now you're insulating your business from recession. That's the number one thing. Show you how to send out expires, how to work short sales, right? Uh, big advantage that we have is my wife worked on the short sale bankruptcy team for Chase for four years. She knows exactly how they approve short sales and how they approve hardships and all that stuff. 
but the pitch is that we're going to show you exactly how to get into REO. If you're already in REO, I'm going to show you what is preventing you from growing your business or preventing you from just from getting more assignments. Like you may not want to grow. You may just want to say, hey, I just want to stay here. I want to get these 10 assets every month. Well, I'll show you why you're not getting them. Uh, but then also to show you what you can do to, like you said, build your business and just be successful. I don't know if that's even, I mean, that's it. We're giving you everything. So if you look at, I'm writing a book right now that's the REO playbook. And it's basically all these thoughts and experience from 10,000 plus assets on how to do a BPO, how to do a trash out, how to approach cash for keys. And not just like, what is cash for keys? Like, yeah, we, we all get it. There's, there's a science to cash for keys. It's an X amount of dollars that you have to deliver. But like the mindset of cash for keys, right? There's a way to get everybody out of the house once you convey that this is what's gonna happen. You paint a picture of a lockout and then paint a picture of this cash for keys. So it's not just training and saying, hey, here's all the systematic things. I mean, like we go into the emotional side and we say, here's how you get buyers. Here's how you get former occupants to work with you who are defensive, who have just lost their house. Here's how to have sympathy, but not be overcome with sympathy so you can't do your job. Here's how to do a BPO and avoid, ha avoid having it rejected. Here's a step-by-step -step plan to build your business. And one thing we've done is there's a lot of frustration in the business with operating systems. Some are fantastic but it's also an income stream for a lot of outsourcers to use their own. And when they use their own, they're not the best system in the world most times. So I've actually built an Excel spreadsheet that is exactly what most operating systems are based on, the theory of it, which is all a date event or another specific event like cash for keys was accepted, right? We have built this with formulas built in so that you can manage your entire pipeline through this. Yeah. Doesn't matter how many. Doesn't if you have a hundred clients and a thousand assets, you can manage them through here, and make sure every property is hit. You can see when the BPO is coming up, when the MMR is coming up. You can see how many days it's been on market, so you can see if it's aged. Like we're giving you the back, really the backstage pass to see exactly how an outsourcer looks at their business. It was one of the biggest things I learned. We were when I was on the Chase team, I was a new asset manager, and we were having a hard time competing with other outsourcers. And then Chase gave us their scorecard. And they said, here's exactly how we're rating you guys. We want you to see this. Since the first time they'd done that, we always just heard like, your age numbers aren't where they should be. Your repair numbers aren't where they should be. This was the first time that they actually came out and they said, here's how we're calculating these. And I said, this is great. I just spent all this time learning Excel. I'll build this dashboard. I'll model this. So I built a dashboard to track our performance against Chase. And every time they sent out their numbers, we were like, yeah, we already know. We already have it. Because we had this back-end information, we became their top outsourcer. We won the Big Cheese Award because we had information. With this program, I've recreated that for an agent. To yeah. say, if you want to know the secrets, here they are. Now you just do the work and you'll be the top person. That's yeah. it. Yeah, when I saw that, dude, I'm like, man, I probably would have paid 20 grand you to have it. that, yeah. you know, when, when I started my REO career, dude, and, and, and I mean, just that, just that alone um, is probably 10 times more than we're actually charging for the entire program, right? Yeah, it is, it is built. Uh, I put a ton of time into that because I built that so that, yeah, it could literally turn into an automated system. It's, it's the bones of it. It's the structure of it. But it's also built in a way because you may have 35 clients. And one of the most impressive things is when an asset manager calls you and you know everything about your assets. So I built it in a way that if, if I'm the agent and you call, I can pull up and I can say, okay, Josh Smith, and I filter by you and I can see every single asset I have for you and I could give you an update like that. Yep. I don't have to look in a system, I've got it. Yep. And when I do that, you think I'm, that you're always on the top of my mind. I yep. just pulled up the information, I had it, right? The, the cool thing with you developing Excel Right, you can upload it to Google Drive. Yep. Download the Google Drive app on your phone. Put it anywhere. So anywhere you're at anywhere. on the planet, you have access to that. Uh, um, and your whole like team has roster. it. Your yep. whole team has it. Yep. All right. So, um, so with all that being said, man. So we've got uh, uh, RU University. Yep. I mean, it's complete. It's done. We got a few little final touches that we're doing to the the, the website and stuff. Um, but uh, by the time that you guys are watching this, it will be 100% available for sale. So there's going to be a link below where you can go um, uh, buy this training, purchase this training yep. um, for, for a very limited time. We're going to start this because we want to make it affordable. Everybody can jump into it. So um, it's $997, um, even though, in my opinion, you know, when we're having pricing discretions, I'm like, this is a $10,000 product. 
Yeah. It's 10,000 hour training, and I know we're going to enter away there very quickly because we know the demand is going to be there, especially yeah. for those that like wait until the market. Because once the market crashes, oh, yeah. then we'll probably be at 20,000 hour training. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then it's... Uh, um, uh, but for right now, you guys, 997. Um, that's not going to last long. So right below is going to be a link to go register. Now this is uh, this isn't a lot, uh, 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 you know, like my 90 Mastery Boot Camp. Um, uh, that you have to wait. You might have to wait eight weeks before one starts. Like this is, you have access to this now. We did it this way um, because really this process, I mean, these are really timeless fundamental truths yeah. that aren't changing, you know, right? So they apply no matter what, but then that way you get instantaneous, immediate access to all this. So you, your team can start learning these processes and, and, and take advantage of it right now. So also below is going to be a link to uh, uh, our free training webinar um, that Ben talked about earlier, where Ben talks about the, the, the five ways to get into um, um, into REO. Yep. Um, now, inside the program, though, we go much more in depth. So the, the oh, yeah. webinar is a free webinar. It's going to give you some some tips and tricks. But um, you know, of course, like anything, you know, we, we we save the gold, the platinum for for what's in the training training program with that. So in the training program, it's not like, oh well, hey, sign up on 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 these websites. It's sign up on these websites. Here's the exact list to sign up on. Give you here's here's exactly yeah. how you fill out your application. When they ask, do you have experience and you don't have experience, here's what you do. And then Ben gives some other yeah. tips that, again, um, I wish to God I would have known because I would <laughs> have yeah. tripled my REO business uh, uh, by knowing some of this stuff, man. So, um, so yeah, I mean, is there, is there anything that we left out um, that you feel that uh, anybody that's listening should know? No, I, I, you hit it right on the head. I mean, the main thing that we're doing is uh, you've put a lot of time into it. I put a lot of time into it. it, it Eventually, eventually it will be a more expensive program. But for right now, we have an opportunity to go in and affect different areas of REO. And that's why we built it the way that we did, right? So by having it in modules, you may already have some REO assets. You may have some listings and you're getting beat up on BPOs or you're getting beat up on MMRs or you can't figure out cash for keys. So we built it this way to say, hey, here's the hole, but you can go take this little piece or this little part of it and chunk this thing down. Uh, but I think one advantage that we have too, and I think why the program's so valuable, and I think why it's only going to increase in value too, is that we're constantly like, when I got that BPO the other day, I didn't just go do my BPO. I recorded a two hour walkthrough step-by-step -step process of how an asset manager looks at a BPO. And I walked through the whole thing and completed the whole thing right there with my whiteboard in the background, making all the notes, messing up and saying, nah, I don't want that comp. I do want that comp. I don't want that comp, pulling it out. That's what we're going to deliver. That's the value we're going to give. Uh, I don't, I don't know how to yeah, say no, anything more it, than man. that. It's awesome. It's massive, dude. So, all right, you guys. Well, we are going to wrap it up now. So those of you that are watching and listening, I know we end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is really just a sort of delusion. Information is empowered. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it that creates power in your life. So whether you're, you're going to buy the training or not, go buy the training. Don't not. But if you choose not to, um, um, which, uh, uh, you know, I can't fathom, but if you choose not to, um, Ben still shared so much great content with you guys that, that can massively impact you. So no matter what, whether you're, you're going to move forward with the purchase or not, take something that you learned today, take massive action on that so you can create the life you know you want and deserve. And Ben, dude, massive honor having you uh, uh, in the studio, uh, uh, flying down from Salt Lake yeah, last night it. in for, for a quick day trip, man. So it's an honor having you in here, brother. Yeah, thanks so much, man. I appreciate being here. Yep, 100%. Cool. All right, awesome, you guys, thanks. we'll see you next time.